Sometimes I daydream about two of my favorite games having little babies. Can you imagine Spyro the Dragon Quest? Or, I don't know, Xenoblade Traveler 2, right? It's just a fun mental exercise. It's just fun to think about. When a mommy game and a daddy game love each other very much. So you can imagine my excitement when I came across Monster Sanctuary, a game that combines both Pokemon and Metroid. For me, that is a damn match made in heaven. So I instantly knew I had to pick it up. And now that I've played it, I knew that I had to share it with you guys. I think I'm gonna break this up into two parts. First, we'll talk about the monster collecting aspects or the, the Pokemon-like elements, and then that'll lead us into the Metroid rabbit hole. But first, I wanna take a little moment to just appreciate the art direction here. If you've watched any of my other videos, you probably know that I am a giant sucker for 16-bit art styles. And Monster Sanctuary, well, I guess I'm a sucker for it straight up then, aren't I? Each area of the map feels fresh and different, and the use of color just elevates each place into having its own sense, its own vibe, if you will. The dungeons feel dark and grimy, yet the snow-covered peaks feel open and spacious and actually high above the clouds. It's always so impressive to me when people can use such a minimal amount of pixels to have such a big impact. It really helps me, at least, when a game is just a joy to look at. It makes you want to come back for more, more often. And not even specifically to play the game, just to look at. When something is nice to look at, playing it becomes so much easier. Okay, okay. Pokemon. So, there's monsters and there's turn-based battles. I mean, that's basically what Pokemon is, right? So, I am sure you're not surprised. But there is definitely enough here to set itself apart not just the Metroid elements. So first of all, the monsters. You choose a starter monster. You get to choose between an eagle, a lion, a toad, weirdly, not my first choice, or a wolf. I went with the wolf because, I mean, it's badass. From there, most screens you encounter will have three little monsters running around it. Obviously, different areas have different monsters and some areas have evolved forms of previous monsters. The monster designs are also really good. I know we've already talked about art, but I mean, you can't talk about a monster collecting game without talking about the monster designs. They are really what keeps people coming back for more. And it's what makes people want to complete the game to catch them all, to paraphrase Pokemon. And they are all really nice. I mean, look, there's some that are pretty basic. There's a mushroom that's okay. Some goblins that are all right. But for the most part, I am a big fan of pretty much all the monsters. Again, not everything is for everyone. Maybe you love the toad starter. I'm not judging. And I did accidentally already just say, but the monsters can evolve as well. But this is a really unique process, actually. So monsters can only evolve at the tree of evolution, and they can only evolve at the tree if you find a certain item. So every monster has an item that will cause it to evolve. So you have to find this item in the world first before you're able to evolve your monster. Now, sometimes I wish that a monster could just get to a certain level to evolve, I think that way you're a bit more inclined to, to want to level up your monsters and use different ones to see what their evolutions might be. But this system works well enough and it does separate it from Pokemon, so I like it. It is a good idea. It's a good idea for something different at least, you know? And the turn-based battles, of course. I love me some turn-based battles. If you don't, that's okay. But I mean, you probably wouldn't have clicked on this video about a Pokemon-like game if you didn't, right? So I mentioned that most areas have three monsters running around them. 
And that is because each battle is 3v3. At least in the wild, anyway. So all the monsters in one area will attack you at once, and it's your job to clear them out. And then that area is now clear. They will respawn eventually, but not for a long time, which is kind of nice with the Metroid elements. Obviously, you're going back and forth quite often. So it does give you a buffer zone for that area being clear for the moment. The turn-based battles, while they are relatively standard turn-based, there is this multiplying mechanic that I really, really like. Every attack in this game hits multiple times. The more times an attack hits, the more your multiplier builds up, so your next monster in line will do more damage. For example, if your first attack hits twice, your next attack is going to have 10% more damage. If your first attack hits four times, your next attack is going to have 20% more damage, so on and so forth. So that third turn of yours can potentially just absolutely slay because you might have done 10 hits beforehand and all of a sudden you've got an extra 50% damage for your final monster. It just adds a little bit more tactics to the gameplay and I'm never opposed to a little bit more thinking when it comes to my games. There's also shinies in Monster Sanctuary, except they're way better than shinies because they actually affect the monster's stats. They actually do something rather than just look different. Ooh. And sometimes they don't even look different in Pokemon. It's crazy. So they call these monsters shifted monsters. Every monster can be shifted to light or dark. And that affects the stats, as I've said, and will give that monster an extra skill. So it's almost like another form of evolution. It's just a way to strengthen your monsters. You can shift regular monsters if you come across certain items, or you can find these shifted monsters in the wild. And they are rare, but they are nowhere near as rare as shinies are in Pokemon. So it is actually an achievable goal to have your whole party shifted in this game. And again, it's just another mechanic that helps it stand out from its peers in the monster collecting category. Not that the game needs to stand apart in the monster collecting category, because it's got all of these Metroidvania elements that help set it apart. As I'm sure you're aware of by now, the game is a platformer. You've seen enough footage of it so far. Platformers are my bread and butter. It's what I grew up with. So I'm always going to gravitate towards something like that. And the Metroid elements come in, of course, when we start talking about exploration, closed off paths, having to backtrack to places you've already been, plus plenty of skills and upgrades. The classic double jump. You don't start your game with a double jump, just a single. That makes places inaccessible. What I like most about the Metroid elements though, double jump is one of the only things that your player character gets. Most of the skills you need to progress further into the game come from your monsters. So it's not just Pokemon with Metroid, it is truly a fusion of these two games. So each monster is able to use a skill outside of battle. And some of these are neither here nor there. Maybe one of them has strength and can push things around. Okay, it's interesting, but it just helps you get to a few chests here and there. Some of them though are far more important. For example, there's many of these switch looking things in the game and you've got to get a lightning attack to hit the lightning switch. But monsters that have lightning attacks are only available in a certain area, which you've got to get to first before you can come back and hit the lightning switches. Do you know what I'm saying? There is a glide move. Some monsters can carry you for a short while. Double jump becomes double jump plus some with an extra glide. And then there's an upgraded glide as well, which you need to reach even further heights. The way that the developers have worked in the monster collecting aspect with the Metroid aspect is really, 
really smart. And I've only just scratched the surface here. There's many more skills and abilities and upgrades you need to complete the game, but I think I'm going to let you guys discover them for yourself. Downsides about Monster Sanctuary, because I think I've made it clear that I absolutely adore the gameplay at the very least. It is an indie game, so it's not like Pokemon or Metroid where they have the backing of Nintendo and probably hundreds of millions of dollars to pour into it. So there are a few things that are lacking. The most obvious one is the story. It does build up a little bit more as you progress along and get a little bit more interesting. But for the most part, it's, I don't know, I could take it or leave it. It's nothing special. It's not the reason I want to play the game. And the soundtrack, while I do enjoy all of the songs on it, every area only has one song, so it can get quite repetitive quite fast. And I actually have resorted to playing other albums on Spotify while I play this game, which is something I really don't like to do with games. But I just thought it would be more interesting to listen to a new album rather than have this same song on repeat while I explore the area. Also, there are online capabilities. I actually think I failed to mention, but there are actual other monster keepers you can fight. So those three on three battles actually become six on six. And there is an online area where you can potentially battle people online. I think the longest I ever waited was like 18 minutes and still didn't find a match. In fact, I've never found anyone to play online with, despite again, waiting for long periods of time. There is online capabilities, just doesn't really work out that way. Fortunately, you gotta have people actually playing the game to play with other people, but that's okay. Hey, maybe this video will kick off and when you're watching this, there's gonna be heaps of people playing Monster Sanctuary online. Uh, I wish. So it's not the perfect game by all means. There are definitely downsides to it. But if you love monster collecting and I've had a really good time with monster collecting lately, then you will love this. I promise you there is more than enough here to tickle that Pokemon itch or that Shin Megami Tensei itch or that Dragon Quest Monsters itch. And by the same token, if you're a Metroid fan, there is still plenty to love here. To be fair, it is monster collecting first, Metroid second, but I still think if you're a fan of those, there is more than enough to keep you entertained here. I just wanted to give a little bit of love to an indie game that I have seen literally nobody talk about, and that's such a damn shame. I've just been on Ursha Gaming's channel talking about underrated Switch games, and I said, there is so many indies that deserve more love than they get, and this is 1000% one of them. It also costs like 15 Australian dollars, which is like seven pounds or like maybe 10 American. It is so cheap, and there's 40 hours of gameplay here. Honestly, you've got nothing to lose. If anything of what I've said in this video slightly tickles your brain, Pick it up, 10 bucks, man. Spend two hours on it and you've more than got value for money there. I am currently in Korea right now, obviously not right now, but as you guys are watching it, I am in Korea. So if the videos slow down, that is why. In fact, the videos are definitely gonna slow down now. So thank you for sticking around. I will see you when I get back in, I don't know. I don't know, I'm going indefinitely. Thank you very much, friends. See you on the next one, whenever that might be. Mwah.